Hi, this is Teddy, and you're listening to Mickey Kendall on Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Demcast Podcast Network. I've read a book that she wrote. Yay! Hey everyone, this is Kelly with Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Demcast family of podcasts. And the other broad with me today is Mickey Kendall, who is the author of a book that came out last fall called Amazon's Abolitionist and Activist, A Graphic History of Women's Fight for Their Rights, and a new book, quite prolific here, uh, called Hood (laughs) Feminism, Notes from the Women That a Movement Forgot. Hi, Mickey. Hi, thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining me. And I am super excited. I rarely get to interview in person. So it's fun when we get to actually be in person. And it feels appropriate that we're in Chicago because I think Chicago is very important in in your life and your work. So let's start with that a little bit. Uh, tell me a little bit about sort of you and and how you got to this place where you put out two books within like six months of each other. And... <laughs> Poor life choices. No, I'm a Chicago girl, born and bred. I was born in Cook County Hospital, grew up on the South Side, Chicago Public Schools. I'm just one of those people, right? And I will argue you to death about Chicago pizza and or hot dogs. Drag your hot dog <laughs> through a garden. Ketchup doesn't belong on hot dogs. These are important Chicago facts. But I... With Amazons, I um, was working on the pitch for Hood Feminism when Alex DeCampi, who I know through comics work, said, hey, Tenspeed is looking for someone to do a graphic about feminism. And I said, oh, OK. And I wrote a before page pitch um, that was very ambitious. We'll put it that way. I was like, 4,000 <laughs> BC to the near future. We're going to use time travel and an AI and let's go. And I was like, they're probably not going to take it. But that was fun to write. And then they were like, yes, we'll take it. Also, we need it before 2020. Also, who's your team? And that's when I learned that they thought I had, like, a plan. (laughs) They were wrong, listeners. They were wrong. Uh, Meanwhile, um, I had been working on the pitch for Hood Feminism, had sent it in to my now agent, Jill Grinberg, at the time she was not my agent, who gave me really great feedback. And then I was working on both together. And you sort of think in publishing time is this weird thing where Things are going to happen, maybe, right? It's a lot of hurry up and wait. So sure, I can proceed on pitching two projects at the same time. You do that all the time in publishing. What I had not thought about was what happens when I'm pitching two projects at the same time and both projects are bought, (laughs) like they both get the, the green light. And then when the dates come back and they're like, hey, 19. 20. (laughs) Some parts of that I had not totally thought through. So I ended up writing both of these in the same year. Don't be me. (laughs) Really don't be me. Right. There's a there's about a six month overlap where I'm researching and writing one and I am drafting stuff for the other one. And so, yay, they are coming out. Excellent. I am probably never going to do this to myself again. I'm lying. I probably will. (laughs) Excellent. So I I mentioned before we started recording that my eight-year-old loved Amazon's abolitionist and activist. I just keep calling it Amazon's and, and he keeps filling in the rest because he's like that. So tell me a little bit about what kind of what you were looking to accomplish that ended up uh, being this this really, as you mentioned, really ambitious project. So one of the things, this is going to be a soapbox. I apologize in advance for the soapbox. We like soapboxes here. Okay, good. A lot of people think they don't like history, Mm -hmm. right? They think it's boring. They learn this long list of dates, right? The Battle of Hastings and all of these things. And they're always in isolation from whatever's happening around them. And so then you remember the numbers. You don't know why you remember any of that. You don't know, for instance that Martin Luther King and Anne Frank were born in the same year, that they would have been walking around in the world at the same time, facing very different but very connected struggles. You don't know that slavery and Jim Crow and and reservations and all of this that's happening in the U.S. is in part inspiration for what Hitler goes on to do in Germany in World War II. You don't see any of that because we don't connect those dots for you before college. Well, by that point, history is optional. 
you never have to learn anything more than basic history, right, in college. Otherwise, K through 12, you learn the same handful of people for Black History Month. You learn of the Constitution for a couple years in a row. You do some social studies, right? And you basically come out kindergarten through eighth grade with a very cursory understanding of history as it relates to you, okay? Then you go to high school and you'll take U.S. history, which is another round of the Constitution, among other things. You may take world history and then your history requirements are over (laughs) for the rest of your life, right? You might take a black history class or something like that in there, depending upon your school and your state's curriculum. But even then, you could come out thinking you know American history and subconsciously think that slavery happened, Lincoln freed the slaves, black people went in a bubble somewhere until Martin Luther King appeared, and that was it, right? You really don't learn very much about what happens for World War I, much less World War II, and you definitely don't learn what's going on in the rest of the world. And you might even come out believing that indigenous Americans had no cities, we're walking around in forests, like we, we have some very weird narratives that appear. So what I wanted to do was show people that would be reading, and it's largely aimed 12 and up. I would argue it's like a PG-13 movie. Some kids under 12 are totally going to be into it. Some kids might need a little more mom support. But that I wanted kids to understand not only what was happening in the world as it related to them at any point, but also how these things related to each other to bring us to where we are now. And you don't learn history this way where it's really fun and interesting unless you take a good history class in college, right? And then you learn all kinds of stuff. That's (laughs) when my major ended up being history. That was not my original major. And you will find all of a sudden, well, why don't people know this stuff? Well, the answer is we never really taught it to them. We certainly didn't teach it in a way that they would be able to retain it or want to retain it or know they needed it. But most explicitly, largely, you don't learn about 4000 BC and women's rights in ancient Egypt. You don't learn about women in history. You don't learn about black women in history. You don't learn about anybody else in history. You don't even realize that disability and labor activism are key parts of women's history because we don't teach it this way, right? But obviously, women are disabled. Women work. Women are warriors. Women do all of these things. Other people are present in the world besides the like five white dudes we learn about K through 12. Yeah. And it's it's so exciting to me to think that my kids are going to have access to these ideas so much earlier in life that I mean, I was in, you know, grad school probably before I thought about a lot of this. And, you know, that's so it's so great to not that there are still problems that we all need to solve. That part's not great, but that, uh, that they'll have access to learning that information. And in a way that is fun, you know, like Teddy loved reading anything that's a graphic novel, anything that has words, he's probably going to read, but, uh, but loved it and wanted to keep reading it and devoured it over the course of a couple of days. And that, uh, being able then to take those ideas and and think about them and apply them to other things that are going on in life, I think is so valuable for kids, uh, you know, and for all kids, but especially for kids like our kids who are living in the city, who are dealing with people who are different than them all of the time, being able to think about that in sort of real terms instead of just like othering people seems super valuable. I think it is super important because we sort of create a situation where we expect adults to have learned things as a kid that we know we don't teach Mm -hmm. children, Mm -hmm. but then we sort of shame adults for not knowing these things. Yeah. And it's like, well, when, when in your average education do you have access? And then even as an adult, do you know where to look? And the other thing, the other reason I wanted to do it this way, not everyone is a good reader. That doesn't mean they're not a good learner. It just means they're not a good reader, Mm -hmm. right? Or they're able to engage with the block of text this book would otherwise be. So I wanted it to be something really attractive, fun to read that, you know, people would want to come back to. Because we don't really retain everything we read the first time we read it. I think it's the average is something like fourth, the fourth pass through, third or fourth pass through is when you start to really lock in the memories for life. I wanted this to be something people would want to come back and actually look at again and again and again and hand off to their kids, to their kids' friends, that kind of thing. 
um, someone came to one of the events and that was her stocking stuffer for the family that year. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so I think that takes us nicely then into hood feminism, uh, which is, of course, geared more toward uh, adults. Uh, And so tell me a little bit about sort of what what you wanted to do writing this book. And, you know, I think there's lots of potential audiences for the book. Were you writing with a specific audience in mind, just specific audiences in mind uh, or not? I so hood feminism is a look at what feminism is doing for women and to to Mm -hmm. some degree to some women. And what I my target audience is anyone who's interested in feminism and its impact and what it could do, should do that kind of that kind of conversation. I wanted it to be a book for all women, not just the academy, not just women who are big names or whatever for all, all of that. I also wanted to make sure that it was inclusionary because you know, trans women are women. Non-binary people don't suddenly stop having a connection to feminism because they're non-binary. You know, being gender non-conforming is not or should not be a reason to be excluded from feminist rhetoric or feminist conversations. So hood feminism's goal is more to talk about what we could do or what we maybe, maybe to some degree what we should do. It's not intended to be wholly prescriptive. I do not think (laughs) <laughs> I am the expert on everything. I This is my perspective as someone who really felt excluded by feminism for a really long time on why that felt mm-hmm. that way and on why other people felt that way. Back in 2013, I had a hashtag, Solidarity is for White Women, and I was angry and I was telling someone about themselves. But also, it trended mm-hmm. globally for hours. Like 7 million people, 11 countries... And one of the reasons it trended was that there were all of these people in all of these places with really, honestly, very similar complaints about what white middle class mainstream feminist rhetoric was doing Mm -hmm. for them and to them, you know. And so when you get into that place and you really look at it, it's like, well, we're back to do people know what they're doing, right? We talk a lot about women's empowerment. What women are we empowering? What are we empowering them to do? We've technically empowered Megyn Kelly to tell small (laughs) children Santa Claus must be white or else. It's not a thing I really wanted to do. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Yeah. So that's the idea. So how do you define feminism? And part of the reason I ask is because I think uh, that we've done a terrible job defining it <laughs> for a very long time in all sorts of ways. Um, but also because I think there's just still a lot of people who will who will sit there and tell you I'm not a feminist who I, I think if you really look at what I how I define feminism, they are feminist uh, and people who like you said, don't feel included in feminism. So so what would your sort of idealized definition of feminism be? My idealized definition of feminism would be equity for all. So it would not necessarily be about becoming a CEO or, you know, that kind of thing, but it would instead be about everyone having their basic needs met and being able to pursue their dreams from a place where, Women are, in fact, able to work together. We recognize we have differences and that there's all of this happening in the world at different places and different times, different challenges, different obstacles, but that we are working collectively to improve the quality of life for everyone. Um, That's my idealized definition. In execution, unfortunately, part of the reason people feel isolated is that to some degree, when we get mired in whether or not you're going to be a CEO, it being equal to white men in their power to oppress, um, being someone who can run the world. But if you're running the world by dropping bombs in the Middle East or supporting apartheid, then I don't really think that's feminism as we should understand it, right? Like we shouldn't be sitting here looking at Margaret Thatcher and going, there's our feminist icon. <laughs> um And so that's one of the reasons I wanted to really kind of bring the conversation back to the idea that if it's for all women, then what do those women need? What do their families need? What do their communities need? How can we help improve that quality of life for all of us? Because, you know, that this is a really old cliche, but rising tide lifts all boats. Mm -hmm. And we've seen over and over again, the statistically in cultures where women are doing well, everyone's doing well, right? If women are have enough to eat, they're educated, all of these things, everyone's quality of life improves. Is it perfect? No. 
I do not think that we have to make perfect the enemy of doing better. Yes. So I, I, I want to tease that out for a minute because I think, you know, one of, uh, one of the ideas that's getting more traction in this presidential primary is the idea of universal basic income. And, I have read Andrew Yang's book uh, <laughs> for a series that we did on uh, presidential candidate books. And, you know, he's trying to make the argument, this sort of rising tide lifts all boat argument that if we just give everybody a little more money, everything will be great and we'll solve all our problems. And I think that is not the answer. Uh, so how how do we address needs in ways that are, are going to be helping the people who need to be helped, who need more access to resources. So I actually think UBI is a terrible policy, Um, not because I don't think we should make sure everyone has enough money to live on, but because I've yet to see a UBI policy address income limits Mm -hmm. on public assisting, housing assistance, that kind of thing. And sure, $1,000 a month sounds great. If you're someplace where rent is $800, I'm not sure what $1,000 gets you in New York. I think it might get you nothing, actually. I'm not sure there is a $1,000 apartment in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, and so my thing is that it would make more sense to raise not just wages to a living wage, but SSDI, right? All of these payments, whether they're from earned income or whatever, to a point, we, we know the math. We know how much apartments cost. We know how much groceries cost. We know how much childcare costs. Okay, great. So if we're going to make a universal income, because not everyone's able to work, so forth, a possibility, we've got to match, Mm -hmm. right? We can't make it so that, well, I work, I deserve the clean, well-lit, beautiful apartment, and you don't because of disability or caretaking or addiction or whatever, whatever your reasons. You deserve to live in some hovel, and how dare you enjoy anything? Like, we've got to get that out of the conversation and sort of shift to a place where I would not be averse to UBI as a concept if we were going to raise the income limits on everything, right? But that extra 12000 a month would basically disqualify you from all other public assistance. Fun fact, you can't live in America off $1,000 a month. <laughs> just can't. It's just not going to happen in any state in the union, as far as I know. If there is a state where you can live off of it, let's then ask how you're living off of it, mm-hmm. right? Because if... You've got a thousand dollars a month. Here's here's my math on why UBI doesn't work as as written in that plan. Mm-hmm. If you've got a thousand dollars a month, and let's say you find somehow a magical time where your apartment is three hundred dollars a month, cool. Do you have health insurance? Okay, let's say you've got a medical card. You have no children because you can't afford children with thousand dollars a month. You probably don't have a partner. You also don't have any space for emergencies. Um, transit issues, health issues, right? If, if you're getting this thousand dollars a month, even on a three hundred dollar, and I still don't know what the quality of that place is going to be, you still got to pay for groceries. Yeah, you still got to pay utility bills, right? You still have all those incidental hygiene, whatever needs. I don't want to police whether or not you get cigarettes or the now legal in our state marijuana or whatever. That that does does no good, mm-hmm. right? If we're going to say, well, let's go with UBI, you know, I've never noticed anyone say, you know what, UBI should be three grand a month, (laughs) right? But three grand a month. Yeah. You move into a place, okay, you still can't afford to live in New York, but you can live in a lot of places at three grand a month. Four grand a month, except for the most expensive cities, you're doing okay. And if you and your partner are together, well, now you can have those kids and blah, blah, blah. But we're going to resent the person who's making 8000 a month in UBI, mm-hmm. right? So you're going to scale that down, say 4000 Let's say we put a cap, three grand a month per person. But at 6000 someone's going to say, that's 72000 So we're going to scale it down again. Why? Well, that's 36000 because when we know that they'll do this, because with public assistance, right, which currently could work out to more money per month than this $1,000, depending upon what your income subsidies might look like, right? Are you getting food stamps? Do you have a child care subsidy? Do you have a um, light heap or one of the other utility bill subsidies? All of these things. So let's say we willow it back down to just the bare meager standard that is public assistance, which is something like $5 a day in food stamps, I think it is, per person. It might be three fifty dollars actually. Uh, that's not enough to live on. And inflation's bell will ring, right? But our metric for this is still rooted, I want to say, 25 years ago. The last time I looked, it's been a, it's been a couple of years since I last looked, but 
the fifth fight for 15. Cool. I was making $15 an hour in the late nineties. Right back then was around six fifty dollars a, a month rent in Hyde Park in the exact same place where I used to live and I paid six seventy five is now sixteen seventy five I want to say, and that also was like a year old at fifteen dollars a month, you still can't afford rent so UBI is a great concept if we're going to make it an actual living wage, yeah, if we're not going to do that then this is a stupid conversation and we should stop wasting time on the idea that an extra thousand dollars a month is magically going to fix anything. Yeah. Because a thousand dollars a month doesn't cover enough in most people's homes. It might, like I said, there might be somebody's house. I do not know that person (laughs) might be, but if we're going to disqualify them from all other forms of assistance, because they got that thousand dollars a month, well, we just made them poorer. So that's not, it's not helpful. Now, if we're going to give you all of the assistance, and a thousand dollars a month, cool. But then we have to get get rid of the thing where we resent poor people mm-hmm. for not suffering out loud in public where we can see them. You know, and I I used to be on food stamps. It's not a secret. I'll never forget being in line in the grocery store and someone saying very testily about a woman in front of me who had like a wick mm. formula mm. coupon and food stamps and whatever. These people having those babies, blah blah blah. And I'm thinking. She's had a baby, it looks like, for five minutes, because this is a pretty new baby. And she looks worn out. Pretty sure this was not how she envisioned having her first child. Pretty sure whatever happened, job loss, because we have paid maternity leave, you know, partners, whatever has happened in her life, she's adjusting right now. And you don't have enough compassion to let her buy food for her baby. That person votes, yeah. right? That person's going to hear this campaign and be like, yeah, I like that. They only get $1,000 because <laughs> that person spends that much on groceries a month. But they think you should only have $1,000 if you're poor. It's a horrible thing to think. <laughs> <laughs> so you said you don't want to be prescriptive, but what would it mean if if we could get there to a place where all women – First of all, all women even wanted to be feminists. That would be (laughs) a step. Mm -hmm. Um, But all women wanted to be feminists and were feminists in a way that were looking for equity for everyone, looking at finding those needs for everybody. What what could that then look like? What would that mean in our society? Um, So let's let's take Hyde Park, for example. Yeah. Okay. so in Hyde Park, that would mean supporting things like rent control. Right. That would mean supporting things like um, keeping the schools open um, and also expanding them. It might also mean wild and wacky things like wacky things where we have clinics for people who maybe don't have much money. Mm -hmm. We have ways for people to avoid violence. Right. Not just external, but internal. We maybe take cops out of the schools like a wild thought. We maybe do something about Chicago's ongoing segregation in terms of teaching staff in Mm -hmm. schools. We maybe do, you know, something about instead of saying those people don't want to live in a better neighborhood, we look at what actually happened to Inglewood, what actually happened to the West Side, right? Um, Because Hyde Park loves to complain when people come in from outside at Halloween and things like that. But the candy you're giving away on Harper, those giant decorations, all of that. It's one day a year. You you can't be nice to people with less than you for a day that's not Thanksgiving or Christmas. You can't give babies candy, right? And I understand it gets congested and all of these things. And I know that sometimes teenagers are rowdy, but somehow we perceive teenagers who are not from Hyde Park and whatever metric, which really appears to be color based, but okay, um, as somehow more dangerous or more threatening than the teenagers in Hyde Park who do the exact same things, <laughs> right? <laughs> Like, if you've ever seen kids from the lab school in Medici, you know that they sometimes are ridiculous. So I I think it would look like saying everyone has a right to exist. Everyone has a right to be safe. Everyone has a right to medical care, you know, quality medical care, quality mental health care. Be amazed what would happen to crime rates if everyone could eat and be in a home that was not falling down. Like, wild thought. We could maybe all have pushed rum even harder to make sure housing, right? 
There's not a reason in Chicago for anyone to be homeless. There's just not. Yes, we have a lot of people, blah, blah, blah. We have a lot of failed condo projects. We have so <laughs> many. We have a lot of burned out buildings that are just taking up space. Yeah. We have a lot of boarded up buildings that are just taking up space. And I could do without the pretty planters down the median on Lakeshore Drive if it meant everybody had a house. I could I could do without whatever lights repaving the, for the 15th time if it meant my neighbors three blocks over didn't have to worry about lead in their water, rats in their home, that kind of thing, right? I heard myself saying to someone that the good thing about Chicago is that we have enough coyotes to keep the rat population down. <laughs> That's a ridiculous statement. It's ridiculous. It's not what we should be counting on. It would look like pushing for government services, you know, to to service the people, right? It probably wouldn't give you soda taxes um, because you would probably have to think about the fact that people who are drinking soda are, that's the closest source of clean water, depending upon your neighborhood in Chicago, right? We had that big municipal project and then they said, hey, by the way, those new pipes, they're going to leak lead into your house. You should get a filter. Or change the line in your house. We're not responsible for it. Right? And then they kind of pimped away. Well, sure. You can put a new line into your house. I'm renting. I can buy the special lead water filter to make sure, whatever. But those water filters are like $35. Right? If you're on food stamps, living in public housing, can you afford a $35 water filter? What's cheaper? Right? And they're not like a never, like it's a never ending need. Yeah. Right? But so it is cheap. So it is more portable. And oh, yeah, we did figure out that those filters only work on certain levels of lead. Past a certain point, they're useless. But you know who is getting clean water to put in their product? Soda manufacturers. They, Pepsi bottling plant got all new lines, all new this, <laughs> right? You can buy all of their products. You can get, fresher fruit, water, all of that in Hyde Park than you can get in, say, Bronzeville or in South Shore. So that's what it would look like in Chicago. It would look like every neighborhood having the same resources, right? Because we say, well, those people in Austin, they're always shooting. Austin has had, Austin and Rivondale have had the largest open-air drug market in America since at least the 80s. I don't know what happens after 30 years 40 years now, really, because it, it probably started before I was born. I remember a Parade Magazine article when I was a kid about this giant open-air drug market, the people trying to get help. We had a reporter standing next to someone, watch them OD, try to get them help, struggle to get help until she said she was a reporter, and then she's able to get help. And that was last year. Maybe we could do something so that's not the neighborhood folks are in. Yeah. Wild thought. <laughs> Are you, do you see signs that, that white feminists are paying more attention, are thinking more about these issues? You know, it, so it feels anecdotally to me as a middle class white feminist that middle class white feminists are paying more attention, but I don't know if that is widespread. I don't know if, uh, I, I don't know how far we have to go. And so what, what are you seeing? Are you seeing any progress? What What would you like people to be doing and thinking about and, and paying attention to and telling their, their friends and their neighbors to do as well? So I'm seeing a little bit of progress. I feel like civility is going to be the real problem, right? Mm -hmm. Because as we run into this next election cycle, yeah, I know a lot of people were somehow surprised at the fact that like the 53% happened and for a lot of women of color we were like yeah we that's what we've been talking i literally said that to you and so that's the thing you have to not just be a white feminist who does better right there are more white women than any other group of women in america right and we always talk about black women and their votes right but statistically speaking every black woman of voting age all of us right we can all vote the right way and if 53% of white women go the other way, we're still in the same place we are right now. So it would really look like, it would really have to look like white women talking to each other. Mm. 
and and white feminism really kind of digging in and looking at hmm megan kelly got a cool buzzy sentence off maybe though i don't write out for the bigot maybe i don't support the racist maybe i i think about what aunt susan said at thanksgiving and why aunt susan thinks that way and turn off aunt susan's access to fox news yeah. turn off Mima's access to fox news um bare minimum sit down and talk to them about it show them these things because unfortunately as we're rotating through i think that the people who are awake it's great i'm not sure they're talking to people who are not that's the question um anecdotally some of them are but several several people have definitely talked about not wanting to rock the boat with mom or grandma mm-hmm. or whatever mm-hmm. and it would be fine if everyone else had their voting rights intact and undisturbed right but we still need the vra which we don't have we we are still seeing voter suppression tactics work and then what we see happening is well those people didn't turn out okay but (laughs) the polls closed they just refused to count those people's votes those people they wouldn't let in to a polling place they demanded ID from those people because fun fact, I know we're all like, oh, everybody has ID. And if you were born in a hospital and your birth was registered and an ID was issued to you, then you have ID. I know from personal experience as someone, even though I was born in a hospital, I was not named immediately. There's a lot of hijinks to get my first ID. Okay. Um, because I didn't have a name until I was a teenager. Not legally. And I know that people are born at home. I actually just got through talking to someone who had been homeschooled Mm. by her parents who were some variant of conservative Christian. Part of the problem of her leaving home at 19, not 17, not 16, 19, she didn't have a birth certificate. No birth certificate had ever been issued to her. And she had to go through a lot to get a copy of baptismal records, to get this, to get that. And that process started when she was 17, when she first was trying to get her first job and realized there was a problem. And they kept sort of discouraging. And so she had to sneak and do some things, right? And at 18, fortunately, she'd been able to secure at least enough copies of records to finally get the birth certificate process started. And she had someone supporting her financially. But without all of that, I'm not sure she would be a person on paper. She might still be stuck. I don't know. We don't know how many people are in that situation, right? Her parents weren't theoretically trying to be abusive or whatever. But when we put up that kind of ID restriction, we're sort of skimming over significant chunks of the population. Mom or dad may choose to be part of whatever sect, whatever religious belief, whatever beliefs, off the grid beliefs. Their kids aren't getting that choice. But then their kids get out in the world and their kids are sort of trapped. We also see this with people who were born in specific hospitals where your ID is suddenly no longer valid because you were born within 100 miles of the border. I know we're going to say, well, that's down south. Well, fun fact, the Great Lakes is considered a border. If you're in Chicago, you're 100 miles of the border. Are you next to the ocean? You're within 100 miles of the border. Oh, that would be New York. Portland, L.A., significant chunks of Cali and Texas and Florida. Oh, that's a lot of people. In fact, fun fact, that's most of the American population is sort of concentrated in these major clusters, right? So maybe you ask why you're a politician in Texas or Georgia or whatever, with those limits already in place to question your birth, person born within 100 miles of the border, is also closing, you know, DMVs, polling places close early, we would prevent you from taking time off to go vote. There's a lot of ways to rig an election. It isn't just Russia. And I think that that's part of what we were also going to see is that, hey, hey, when we say that you kind of <laughs> got to protect everybody's rights, you kind of make it so that former felons, people arrested, whatever, whatever. Are you over 18? You should be able to vote. And I would argue 16. Yeah. Right. But. Let's say we want to stick to the 18. Cool. We should make sure 18-year-olds can vote. Mm -hmm. Right? There's never been any proven wave of people coming into the U.S. to vote for whatever. 
maybe we could focus less on the myth and more <laughs> on the reality. I don't know. Well, but yeah. So when does the book come out? Hood Feminism comes out February 25th in the U.S. and the U.K. and a bunch of other places. All right. Excellent. And people can buy it everywhere. Everywhere. Everywhere books are found. Everywhere books are sold. So whether that is your local bookstore, you can go with your indie, your fave indie. If you've got a fave indie, you can do Barnes and Nobles. You can do Amazon, the giant corporate overlords. You pick. If you're in the UK, I think Waterstones. Um, I don't know bookstores in India off the top of my head, but I know that it will be available there too. So I feel like you'll be able to find it everywhere you go. <laughs> and uh, Amazon's Abolitionist and Activist is already in stores. It is in stores. It is available through your local comic shops, your local bookstores, again, the dreaded corporate overlord of Amazon, and everywhere else books are sold. And would be an excellent gift to uh, give to some school libraries. <laughs> school libraries, especially with Women's History Month coming up. You know that project that everyone's kid is going to be assigned? I've already given you names of <laughs> that you can use for that project in a handy dandy book form. Yes. So, uh, Mickey, are there, we could probably keep talking all day, but are there other things that you would like to make sure that we talk about? I would love for us to talk about the idea that it has to be perfect. Mm. Your candidates have to be perfect. Listen, I'm not going to be prescriptive about who you should vote for, except not for the giant orange thing in the White House right now. <laughs> but I will say this. It has to be whoever you personally think is best, right? But don't get hung up on the idea, well, my candidate didn't get chosen, so I shouldn't go vote. You just have to pick the best of what we've got. I think of voting as harm reduction hmm. and who will do the least harm and go from there because... At this point, a lot of people really will benefit from you exercising your right to vote, even if they don't can't personally vote right now, because our policies are having an impact on people all over the world. We could maybe try electing people with less terrible policies. Let's go with that. <laughs> try it. It's the thought. I don't know. Pretty bold there. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, no, totally agree. <laughs> and And I think... The one benefit of thinking that way, of thinking like it doesn't have to be perfect, is that then when something comes out about that candidate that you're in love with, it, it doesn't become this world changing, shocking. It's yes, this person is also human. Now I will evaluate again. Is this the right person to vote for? But we but we don't they're they're not like I mean, superheroes. <laughs> I'm a Chicago girl born and bred. I went to school with one of Dorothy Tillman's kids. I don't understand this idea that our politicians are going to be messianic heroes, mm -hmm. that they're going to be flawless, that if the guy we think is perfect doesn't get in, then we can't vote for anyone. You know, full disclosure, my preferred candidate dropped out of the race before we ever got to the primary. It happens. Yeah. Right? I'm already picking between second choices. But you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to pick. Yeah. So, so that's my big, currently as we head towards Super Tuesday, <laughs> make sure your vote count make sure you can vote yes. get your stuff together yes go in make sure move is a provisional valid and then go vote please go vote that's it yes agreed agreed mm -hmm. and people should also follow you on twitter that's how i first came to know about you okay. is uh through twitter uh so tell everyone your twitter handle um <laughs> <laughs> my twitter handle is carnethia k-a-r-n-y-t-h-i-a -A. you can usually find me there um, a few times a day, I'm spending less time on Twitter <laughs> because I can't. We all should. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do politics Twitter right now for my own emotional comfort and support. Yeah. Um, but no, so I am on Twitter. I am on the book of the face. Less and less, though. Also, don't send me messages on Facebook. Because <laughs> I promise you, it's like you're rolling the dice on whether I'll ever see it. Yeah. Just, you know, my name at Gmail. Twitter. These are the places to find me. <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Well, Mickey, thank you so much uh, for coming and talking to me. Thank you for your excellent books. And uh, like I said, it's always super exciting to actually get to talk to someone in person, uh, someone who is my neighbor. <laughs> so it's good to, to meet you in person uh, and uh, really enjoyed the conversation. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Two Broads Talking Politics, part of the Dimcast Podcast Network.
Our theme song is called Are You Listening off of the album Elephant Shaped Trees by the band Emu Nuri, and we're using it with permission of the band. Our logo and other original artwork is by Matthew Wefflin and was created for use by this podcast. You can contact us at Two Broads Talking Politics at gmail.com or on Twitter or Facebook at Two Broads Talk. You can find all of our episodes at Two Broads Talking Politics.com or anywhere podcasts are found.